Three years ago next week, we gave a talk at DDP in Las Vegas on the tale of essentially a public-private partnership between the state of Delaware and Bloom Energy. Um, and since no one, almost no one will remember what I said back then, let me tell you the tale and uh, update it as I go on. Uh, I also want to thank um, Becky uh, Dunlop from Heritage and Paul Dreesen from CFAC for the help they gave three years ago following the presentation. Uh, it was very, very useful and hopefully will eventually, well, I don't want to give away the answers. Any of that. First of all, and before I start, let me introduce my co-author who's done most of the work. This is Lindsay Levine. Um, he came from South Africa. He lives in Sausalito, California. He received a master's degree in chemical engineering, and he is an extreme environmentalist. Uh, that's one of the weird things in Delaware, is that it has become a teaming up of environmentalists and conservatives to fight the oligarchs. Um, what I've learned is that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, well, at least for now, but in Lindsay's case, he will always be my friend. Our story for Bloom Energy in the state of Delaware begins with the Daimler Chrysler of Newark assembly plant, which employed 2,100 people, all of whom lost their job when the plant was idled on Christmas Day of 2008. Seven months later, Production ceased at the General Motors Boxwood Road facility in Wilmington, Delaware, as part of the 2009 bankruptcy and restructuring of General Motors. Never fear, though, because in 2010, Fisker Automotive promised to build sporty hybrid cars at the Boxwood Road facility. The state of Delaware announced a $21.5 million economic incentive for Fisker Automotive, and Vice President and former Pennsylvanian third Senator Joe Biden joined Fisker Automotive executives for the announcement. Uh, the Obama administration then awarded Fisker Automotive a half a, a half a billion dollar Department of Energy loan. As you probably know though, Fisker Automotive failed and filed for bankruptcy in 2013. Fisker Automotive never built a single car or employed a single worker in the state of Delaware. So what was Delaware going to do? We're a state of just under a million people, um, about the size of the metropolitan area of the city of Phoenix, or city of, excuse me, not Phoenix, the city of Tucson. Um, so 6,000 lost jobs is not trivial. Um, so what were we going to do? Well, fortunately, we had high elected a progressive governor, Jack Markell, who had the foresight to select a 30-year-old wunderkind and climate entrepreneur, Colin O'Mara, as a secretary for natural resources, environmental control, or DENRAC. Omara was originally the clean tech strategist for the city of San Jose, California, and was a primary architect of the city's green vision, which was a plan to combine economic development with environmental sustainability. And it turned out just down the street in San Jose was an up-and-coming uh, energy firm called Bloom Energy. So Markel and Omara saw Bloom Energy as a perfect opportunity to pair with the state of Delaware, and thus they entered into a partnership with Bloom Energy that began in April of 2012. The goal, as you can see, was to merge job creation with clean and green energy for a win-win sol solution. Here is Bloom Energy's founder and CEO, K.R. Sridhar, explaining their mission statement at that groundbreaking ceremony. And when we started the company, the mission was very simple. The mission was to find a way to provide clean, reliable energy in an accessible and affordable way to all 9 billion people on the planet. 9 billion people on the planet. How many people are there on the planet? Yeah, nine years later, we haven't even hit 8 billion people. So this won't be the last misstatement of fact you'll see Bloom Energy and their minions make. Uh, for example, here's more from that groundbreaking, groundbreaking event. I've got a hunch, uh, KR, that you and, and your team are going to make everybody here who believed in this project, who believes in your company, who believes in you, uh, all the prouder. There is a catalyst in that humming box. In the end, I don't know exactly what the catalyst is in that box. The installed bloom cell that we have in Springfield, it's supplying about 35% of the power for the facility and it's reducing our carbon emissions by about 40%. And the kind of jobs we're going to create here are clean, enjoyable, efficient, and the kind of environment they're going to work in is the same thing. And we intend for this plant back here to be about the people. And, uh, and, and we intend to 
At the same time that we can promote the people, we can develop a system that, that creates world-class manufacturing. It's about the people. It's about taking essentially the Green New Deal nine years early and essentially moving it into the state of Delaware. We're going to create clean, green energy and put people to work. It's a win-win situation. So in April 27, 2012, we launched into this venture. Two weeks later, in the Springfield News Sun, there's an article on a uh, meeting that's going on in Davos, Switzerland. And in that meeting, the, or the, the article on that meeting is, the world is starting to worry about America's paralysis. And if you read the article, it says, you can understand why foreigners are uneasy. They look at America and see a president, this being Barack Obama, elected by a solid majority, coming into office, riding a wave of optimism, controlling both the House and the Senate. Yet a year later, he can't win passage of his top legislative priority, health care. Enter a member of the delegation that happened to be there, who is K.R. Sridhar of Bloom Energy, who says, our two-party political system is broken. Just when everything needs a major repair, not a minor repair. I'm talking about health care, infrastructure, education, energy. We are the ones who need a Marshall Plan now. Now, if you continue to read the article, you'll see just what that Marshall Plan is. It's called the Beijing Consensus. It's a Confucian, communist, capitalist hybrid under the umbrella of a one-party state with a lot of government guidance, strictly controlled capital markets, and an authoritarian decision-making processes capable of making tough choices and long-term investments. Now, where was Sridhar going to find a one-party state with a lot of government guidance and an authoritarian decision-making... Uh, okay, that's the state of Delaware. Well, four weeks, or excuse me, four months later, uh, Governor Markell writes an article in Quartz magazine entitled, Why the Tiny U.S. State of Delaware is Telling Children, Learn Chinese Today, You'll Have a Job Tomorrow. Well, the question is, what does Bloom Energy actually do? Bloom Energy makes fuel cells. If you aren't familiar with fuel cells, let's let Bloom Energy explain how their bloom boxes work. A solid oxide fuel cell is a high temperature fuel cell. At high temperature, warmed air enters the cathode side of the fuel cell and steam mixes with fuel to produce reformed fuel, which enters on the anode side. Next, the chemical reaction begins in the fuel cell. As the reformed fuel crosses the anode, it attracts oxygen ions from the cathode. The oxygen ions combine with the reformed fuel to produce electricity, water, and small amounts of carbon dioxide. Now, the take-home message is, what are they using as fuel? He didn't say it, but you could see it. It's natural gas. So yeah, it's fossil fuel. But, trust us, it's clean energy. There are no, ha no bad things. And, in particular, only a small amount of CO2. So, the state of Delaware, Bloom Energy, enter into this sweetheart deal. The state of Delaware has agreed to provide $16.5 million to establish a manufacturing facility on what used to be the Daimler Chrysler uh, facility, now the UD campus. They will give $5.6 million to, do, uh, to Bloom Energy as part of a lease execution grant. Another $5.6 million for a certificate of occupancy grant. They will give them $6,250 every year for each full-time worker they employ. They will give them a capital expenditure grant of $750,000, and over the next 21 years, they will give them more expen capital expenditures of $25 million. And the surcharge on the energy that Bloom Energy produces is guaranteed for 21 years, and the rent on the facility, which is great if you can get it, just $1 a year, for the next 21 years. In exchange, Boom Energy has promised to establish a manufacturing facility in this $16.5 million uh, manufacturing facility. They will spend at least $50 million to renovate and upgrade the facility. They will employ 300 full-time workers by 2014, 600 full-time workers by 2015, 900 by 2016, and then continue to employ 900 workers until September 2023. Remember, this is using clean, green energy as a job creation tool in the state because 
we've just lost 6,000 jobs. Now, if you're doing the math, stop it, because it's not going to make any sense. We've just lost 6,000 jobs and replacing them with 900. Yeah, well, just play along. So here we go. The state builds the $16.5 million facility, which is a quarter of a million square foot building that Bloom Energy paints its logo on the roof. And off we go. Now, the question is, how did the state propose to pay for all this? Well, normally you'd say, well, they just raise taxes. No, 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 no. This is why you hire a 30-year-old climate entrepreneur. Essentially, this is the Public Service Commission, and here it is, the approval of qualified fuel cell provider project tariffs. By the way, anytime you see qualified fuel cell provider, that's a euphemism for Bloom Energy, but it's obfuscating the fact that it is Bloom Energy, so you don't know it's Bloom Energy, but Bloom Energy is the only qualified fuel cell provider in the state. And if you read the fine print, it says it's to allow energy output from Delaware manufactured fuel cells to be considered a resource eligible to fulfill a portion of the Renewable Energy Portfolio Standards Act, or REPSA. So, what's happening? Money is being allocated for renewable energy, but under this agreement, we are reallocating that money to subsidize Bloom's electricity production using natural gas. So what that means is fossil fuels are now renewable energy, but only if you consume them in a Bloom Energy fuel cell in the state of Delaware. <laughs> Moreover, the latest legislative session has just essentially codified Bloom, so renewable energy in Delaware is defined as wind, solar, or Bloom Energy fuel cells using natural gas. How's this work? Well, here's my May bill from, um, from Delmarva Power. And you can see here on my bill, I paid $2.05 for wind and solar, and I paid $2.25 for the qualified fuel cell vendor, which of course you now know is Bloom Energy. Most people that have a family of four are paying probably about $15 uh, a, a month on their bill for this renewable compliance charge. The weird thing about it is, it's hidden under the delivery charge instead of over here under the supply charge, which is where you'd assume it should be. But nevertheless, if you do read the fine print, it says both the wind and solar and qualified fuel cell portions provide compliance required by Delaware's Renewable Energy Portfolio Standards Act, or REPSA, and Bloom Energy pro uh, provides approximately two-fifths of that compliance annually. Jack, why would you do this? As Jack says, the surcharge is paying for energy created in Delaware as opposed to going elsewhere. This allows the state to achieve its goal of having 25% of its energy from alternative sources in 2025. And based upon uh, the latest legislative session, now 40% by 2035. Jack says, either we give the money to Bloom Energy or to an out-of-state wind or solar company that would not have created any jobs in Delaware. Or we give it back to the ratepayers and let who actually earn that money. And, um, I'm, I know, I need to stop this. So the question is, what do we get for all of this? So let's go back to the deal. At present, the state of Delaware has either completed or is on schedule to complete everything they promised. Bloom Energy was supposed to establish a manufacturing facility on the campus, and yes, that in fact they have done. They were to spend at least $50 million to renovate and upgrade the facility with suppliers, uh, buildings, and so forth. As of July of 2021, they have spent a grand total of not one dime. The rest of this is all job creation. Remember, that was the whole purpose, was job creation. So we are supposed to have 900 full-time jobs by September 30th of 2016. Right now, they should have at least 900 full-time jobs. When you look at the rate schedule, they have been behind every year and are fall, have fallen behind. Right now, the latest, which came out as the end of September, they had only 397 employees out of 900. The interesting thing about all this, in 2017, uh, they were actually fined by the state as opposed to, as a part of the deal. Uh, they were fined $1.5 million for not meeting payroll. Um, 
In 2017 alone, the 598 people they didn't employ resulted in a payroll savings of $44 million. The reason why this happened, well, the chief marketing officer explains it this way. There is no perfect science to forecasting employees' numbers years into the future. He anticipates the company with a future date of 900 employees in Delaware, but I'm not going to put a time frame on it. <laughs> Sorry, Matt, you did put a time frame on it. It was called a contract. But think about this. Let's suppose that parking outside is $20 a day, but if you park illegally on the street, you'll get a fine of $2. So what are you going to do? You park illegally, you pay the fine. It's a whole lot cheaper than doing it legally. So with a failure to create the agreed among number of jobs, that's exactly what Bloom Energy did. Since May, uh, up through May, how much, how much money has Bloom made on this deal with Delaware? Well, money from the U.S. taxpayers, Delmarva ratepayers, Delaware taxpayers, they've come up with $461.5 million. By Christmas, it will be over uh, $500.5 a billion. They had to repay, as I said, $1.5 million for not meeting payroll in 2017. The next next check comes up in 2023. So their net take has been $460 million through May 31st. To show you how this works on a yearly basis, when you consider the qualified fuel cell provider payments and the cost for natural gas, the total cost to generate electrons from Bloom Energy is $41.5 million. They generated last year 222,392 megawatts. So the total generation cost per megawatt hour is $187.25. The grid charges $33.65. So the Bloom Energy profit is over $150, $150 per megawatt hour. Now, as the Liberal News Journal in Delaware wrote, criticizing Bloom Energy and its subsidy that Delawareans pay through our electric bills is a favorite pastime in Delaware. However, you would assume that the bluest of blue institutions in the bluest of blue states would be happy with this deal. You'd be wrong. In an article in the New York Post, here is Executive Vice President Alan Brangman from UD, and he says, yes, the University of Delaware, too, is unhappy with the company. He says, Bloom leases 50 acres and originally planned to build six other buildings to house suppliers. They haven't done that yet. They still haven't met numbers. Sitting here tonight, I'll tell you, the university will probably never do another 50-acre deal like that. It's way too much land to give away to one user. We're not interested in doing those kinds of things again. Now, at this point, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to ask the fundamental question I think that everybody has on their mind. Why should I care? I would ha hazard a guess. I am the only resident of the state of Delaware in the room. I am the only person that gets their energy from Delmarva Power. If there's anybody else in the room that get, does that, let me know. But I don't think there's anybody else in the room. So isn't this simply a case of, sorry, Mr. Gates, sucks to be you. Uh, there, but for the grace of God, go us. Well, no, because this is Doctors for Disaster Preparedness. So I'm going to introduce two words that we will probably be interested in hazardous waste. Now, I know what you're saying. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Gates. I saw the chemical equation. There's nowhere in there anything that looks like hazardous waste. Okay, maybe carbon dioxide can be considered an existential threat to the planet, but it's not what we define as hazardous waste. So how do you get off saying that Bloom Energy is not producing clean energy? Well, anybody that knows anything about methane knows that there's no such thing as pure methane feed. There's all sorts of other things in there. We add mercaptan, for example, to give it an odor so that when we have actually a methane leak, you would know about it instead of finding about, about it when you hear the explosion and see things starting to fly through the air. But there's all sorts of other fun things in methane, which includes such things as benzene, and hydrogen sulfide, and hexavalent chromium, and lead, and volatile organic compounds. These either escape into the atmosphere, or they must be removed in canisters. Knowing this, I go to another friend of mine who should have been an author on this uh, uh, presentation, but he didn't want to be. But uh, John Nichols is a very good friend of mine. He has been labeled as a serial FOIA submitter by the press even though what he's really doing is what the press should be doing all along. He sued the state, and he said, you've put these things in the Coastal Zone, and the Coastal Zone Act says hazardous waste cannot be located in the Coastal Zone, 
and so I'm filing a lawsuit. And environmentalists decided not to go in with him, only to find out after an eight-hour uh, court hearing that he lost the case because he didn't have standing, which means environmentalists no longer have standing either. That's why they've now joined forces with us. But in particular, John said, look, you've got sulfur in that mix. And Bloom's Energy General Manager said, yeah, sulfur is in fact poisonous to the electrochemical process, so we remove it. We use a resin bed that's like a sponge that absorbs mercaptan. But mercaptan is non-toxic. John says, well, I'm not really talking about mercaptan. I'm talking about hydrogen sulfide. To which case, Bloom Energy General Manager said, there is no hydrogen sulfide used or produced in the process. Think about that for a minute. It's not on the left side of the chemical equation. It's not on the right side of the chemical equation. Doesn't mean it's not there. It's just not used or produced in the process. This is like Humpty Dumpty and Alice of Wonderland, who said, when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. But John, as I said, is a, FOIA, is a serial FOIA submitter. So he comes back and says, that's nice, but what I have here is a training proposal for Bloom Energy submitted to the state of California. And in there, you were asking for $133,000 to provide a number of things. One includes hazardous materials and particularly hydrogen sulfide awareness. And if you read it, it says, Hazardous material training will be provided to all employees that handle hazardous materials during the production process and at customer sites when installing and servicing the units. Mr. General Manager, what say you? Well, the general manager comes back and says, that's an easy explanation. It was erroneous because there is no hydrogen sulfide involved in the manufacture or operation of the fuel cells. It was simply our mistake to ask for that in the first place. No indication they're giving any of the money back to the state of California, but it's just simply, we are, as we've told the state, we are clean and we are green and we do not produce any hazardous waste at all. Now, I've learned, you can lie to state officials. You can lie in court. There is one group you do not lie to, your investors. And so, literally, the week before I gave the presentation here three years ago, Bloom Energy took their company public. And so they filed an S-1 form with the SEC. And if you read the S-1 form, it says, we are subject to various environmental laws and regulations that could impose substantial costs upon us and cause delays in building our manufacturing facilities. If in the future, contamination is discovered on properties formerly owned or operated by us, or owned or operated by us, or properties to which hazardous substances were sent by us, wait a minute, how would you be sending hazardous substances if it's neither used nor produced in the process? Well, as I go on to mention, our energy servers, like other fuel cell technology-based products of which we are aware, produce small amounts of hazardous waste and air pollutants, and we seek to ensure that they are handled in accordance with applicable regulatory standards. For example, natural gas contains benzene and hexavalent chromium, which our energy servers emit. So John says, okay, so they are removing hazardous waste. So I want to know how much of it they're moving and where they're moving it to. So he sends a FOIA request to the Department of Natural Resources um, Hazardous Waste Division and says, please send me your manifest. And they said, we don't have any. And he writes back and says, how come you don't have any? And the answer was, the lack of manifests implies that Bloom Energy has not generated any hazardous waste that required disposal from 2017 and 2018. Have I told you that John Nichols is a serial FOIA submitter? <laughs> well, he was also able to get lots and lots of these. And I'll show you just two of them. You know what they are? Hazardous waste manifests for transmitting benzene in canisters. Where are they coming from? They're coming from Bloom Energy in Newark, Delaware, Bloom Energy in Newcastle, Delaware, and they're going to Albuquerque, New Mexico. There's others going to Indianapolis, Indiana. They're going to other places around the country. And what was the date on these? July 2017. So you don't have hazardous waste manifests, but here's what you should have had. And yes, they are producing benzene in the state and transporting it out. How come your hazardous waste division knows nothing about it?
Well, this is where Lindsay got involved. See, back in 2014, Lindsay had asked the Obama EPA to investigate hazmat by Bloom. Said, they're fuel cell providers. They've got to be putting out hazmat. And nothing was done about it because largely they were told by the EPA at the time, unless you've got some proof, there's nothing on which we can act. Well, now the disclosure of the existence of manifests for 2015 to 2018 causes the EPA to finally investigate Bloom Energy's actions. How do we know that? Because while I was on stage in um, Las Vegas at DDP, an article appeared in EE &E News that same week. Published, in this case, August 2nd, 2018, Top Murkowski Staffer Joins Clean Tech Company. Pat McCormick, the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee's top lawyer, has left Capitol Hill and is now the Vice President of Regulatory for the fuel cell firm Bloom Energy. Five days later, you find in Politico, Aiken Gump signs Bloom Energy. And in fact, Ryan Thompson, a former chief of staff to Senator Jim Inhofe, will lobby on issues related to the regulation of fuel cells under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, or RICRA. So in other words, something has happened because all of a sudden, Bloom Energy is hiring a bunch of Republican law top lawyers. <laughs> same time, same week. August 9th, oops, August 9th, John gets a letter from EPA and says, we can't be sending you any more FOIA requests because everything is now covered under a claim of confidential business information, and we're working through that to figure out what happened. This is a bad week for Bloom Energy. EPA starts an investigation. Uh, I'm giving a talk at DDP, and MarketWatch releases an article. In just one week as a public company, Bloom Energy has squandered its credibility. And you can see this is August 6th of the same of 2018. Chief executives post IPO comments to MarketWatch had to be officially disavowed to the SEC. What happened was, when asked about the company's profitability, Sridhar told three MarketWatch staffers that Bloom was a profitable company as of the second quarter, and he expected that to be continued going forward. When asked in a follow-up question whether he meant profitable in generally accepted accounting principles, Sridhar answered affirmatively. MarketWatch led with those comments in a story published on July 25th when Bloom Energy stock was rocketing upward with its post-IPO debut on the New York Stock Exchange. Now, the statement by Bloom is, uh, the company disclaims any statement regarding its expectations for future profitability, where cash flows makes no such forecast or prediction at this time regarding its future operating results and undertakes no obligation to do so in the future which explicitly walks back several of the CEO's comments in the July 25th interview with MarketWatch. Spokesman for Bloom declined to comment beyond the filing. So what happened next with the EPA? Nothing. Now see, I am told that the wheels of justice turn slowly largely because she's blind and so if she's driving a car she can't move very fast, but they do turn and eventually justice will be served. So we wait, and we wait. And we waited for two years. And then on the day in which I join the federal government, which is a day for me that will live in infamy, but in any event, September 8th, 2020, over two years after that, an article appears in the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. Murkowski announces appointment of the Central Special Counsel. She and today announced that Patrick McCormick has returned to the staff of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee and will again serve as Special Counsel. He's back. Gee, I wonder what happened. Well, of course, you know what happened. The report has been finished. It's just a matter of finalizing it, and we can release it. Now, the report was never released publicly, but if you know anybody that can submit FOIAs, and I apparently do, then we were able to get a copy of it. In December of 2020, the Trump EPA released the report. Now, I know what you all are waiting for. What did the Trump EPA find, and how much of a fine did they levy against Bloom Energy? So here's the report, dated December 15th, 2020, and here's what they found them guilty of. Not lying to the state of Delaware, but in fact, 
33 shipments of hazardous waste sent without a hazardous waste manifest to a permitted receiving facility from September 8th uh, of 2015 to October 3rd of 2016. 225 shipments of hazardous waste sent without a hazardous waste manifest to a non-permitted receiving facility from September 8th, 2015 to October 30th, 2016. And 105 shipments of hazardous waste sent without a hazardous waste manifest to a permitted receiving facility after that date. If you're doing the math, that's 363 shipments of hazardous waste without a hazardous waste manifest to both permitted and non-permitted receiving facilities. What kind of fine do you think that should have generated? <laughs> yeah, stop it. It generated a fine of $1.16 million. That's it. If you're doing the math, and I told you not to, less than $3,200 per illegal shipment. That's it. I guess the lawyers were really worth it after all. So this past March, John Nichols sends another FOIA to the Hazardous Waste Division at DENREC and says, I want to know what kind of manifests they've given to you since the beginning of 2020. In other words, now that we all know there's, they're shipping hazardous waste, how much are they shipping? And the answer was, he said, please provide copies of the required manifest for the transportation of hazardous waste generated by Bloom Energy in Delaware. And the answer was a record search whoops, by the compliance section of the Division of Waste and Hazardous Substances have returned no records regarding manifests. The manifests are retrievable through the EPA website. Look, we don't care anymore. We're not following it. We're not worried about manifests. If you really want a bunch of manifests, talk to the EPA. I'm sure they're watching it, but we aren't. This is the hazardous waste division of the state. Well, it gets worse for Bloom Energy. Here's an article in Delaware Online. Bloom Energy blamed an accounting error for misstating the amount of money it's made in recent years. Startling investors, Bloom said its revenues of the past four years are off by less than 10%, a limit that amounts to nearly $200 million. Uh, the adjustment has no impact on our total cash, said the company. And if you keep reading, it says, yeah, there were rumors of layoffs to which a Bloom spokesman said, yeah, some specific roles in Delaware were eliminated. So you couldn't make 900, you were down inside 400, and now you're laying off more people. So it was supposed to be job creation, it's not creating jobs. It was supposed to be clean. We don't produce any hazardous waste. It's not clean. At least, at least it's producing green energy little bit of carbon dioxide, so maybe it's a little bit blue-green or something, I don't know. But it's, it's green energy. At least we have that to stand on. And I'm a climatologist. I should be interested. This is all about CO2. You didn't think I was going to get out of here without talking about something climate-related. In any event, in October of 2018, Bloom Energy says, look, we're going to have to replace our old Bloom boxes with the new Mark V versions. Their claim is the new boxes will only emit 700 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. The box replacements are completed in December of 2019, a little over a year later. Lindsay keeps track of this stuff. For 2020, guess how much the new boxes emitted? 778.25 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. In June, which is two uh, last month, they emitted 790 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. See, what happens is, over time, they degrade. And when I say over time, really fast. Here you can see, if you follow the red line on the left uh, and ignore the spikes, because you can see the spikes on the right are created by turning it off and turning it back on again. So if you ignore the spikes, you can see they start out, this happens to be at Equinix, New York, but they start out about 740 um, pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour, and by the time you get out to eight months later, they're up over 800. So they degrade fairly rapidly. In fact, Lindsay has put this together uh, from a number of different sites. By the time you get out about 26 months, they go from an installation of about 740 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour to up over 900 in just two years. Now, at this point, we probably should compare them to a state-of-the-art natural gas plant. If you do that, you find that after a one year, or even in some cases on the day they're turned on, bloom boxes are actually emitting more CO2 per megawatt hour than a state-of-the-art natural gas plant would emit. 
The energy they're producing is now five times more expensive because of all the subsidies. When we started this, it was only designed to be three times more expensive. It's getting worse, and that's in part because the cost of natural gas has gone down. And, of course, over the 150-year history of the fuel cell technology, there's never been a profitable fuel cell company, and Bloom Energy is not in that category. That is, they aren't, still aren't profitable. Now, I am, unfortunately, still employed by the University of Delaware, but uh, it's not going to stop me from telling the following story. In July 10th, 2014, the University of Delaware was looking to come up with a way to market the old, uh, the new Star Campus, which was the old Daimler Chrysler facility, which you see here. And a company came to them called the Data Centers LLC. And they said, we want to put a data center on this site. And the reason being is if you look at that line that demarks the north area of where they've removed all of the Chrysler facility, that actually turns out is the northeast corridor. That's where Amtrak runs. So putting a data center literally right on the northeast corridor would be perfect. And to run a data center, of course, we need electricity. So we are going to install a 279 megawatt cogeneration power plant. And the nice thing about that is excess energy it produces will simply give to the city of Newark, which will cut down their costs. This is a win-win situation. And the university thought it was a win-win situation. And so they signed the agreement. And all was proceeding along until the... Um, University faculty got wind of this, I guess pun intended. And they said, look, wait a minute, this is an excellent opportunity. If you're going to put in a data center, let's run a data center 100% on wind and solar. This would be great. And the data center's people said, are you crazy? We need 24-7 we need electricity. You can't run 24-7 plant on wind and solar. But they got the, the faculty galvanized the community. They complained that uh, natural gas is going to emit benzene. It's going to emit hexavalent chromium. It's going to emit all sorts of toxins into the atmosphere. Remember, this was an automobile assembly plant. I lived literally right next to this place in grad school. And there were days in which you could smell the paint. So uh, noxious fumes were never a problem with this facility. But no, they raised complaints, and so eventually the University of Delaware backed down and got sued. And the university issued the statement that said, given the university's commitment to reduced carbon emissions, its strong reputation in renewable and carbon-free energy research, the emplacement of a fossil fuel-based facility this size does not appear consistent with UD's vision of a first-class science and technology campus. And right on that same campus across the street is Bloom Energy which is building fuel cells which are less efficient in terms of carbon dioxide production than the 279 megawatt plant that they were proposing to put in. Oh my. I wonder sometimes why I stay at that state. In any event, it's a long question. February of 2020, Republican state senators write a letter to then Denre or the new DENREC secretary, Sean Garvin demanding that Bloom Energy should be fined $100,000 a day because they're emitting more CO2 than allotted. Garvin says, nope, I'm only interested in yearly CO2 emissions, not the rate, which if you stop and think about it, is a rate. But nevertheless, he says, and we do take CO2 emissions seriously. Now stop and think about this for a moment. You have a bunch of Republican senators complaining about a fossil fuel-based company emitting too much carbon dioxide and demanding that they be fined and going to the Democrats who say, eh, I don't think so. Only in Delaware would that scenario be playing out. A year later, February 2021, Lindsay Levine, here we go again, informed Sean Garvin that the yearly CO2 emissions were much higher than permitted by more than 3,200 tons. So how does Bloom Energy explain this? Well, there's, <laughs> there's a logical explanation for what happened. It was 2020. What was different about 2020? It had nothing to do with COVID, by the way. Do you know? Sure you do. 2020 was a leap year. There were 366 days in that year, not 365. That's why we went over by 3.5%. Come on, it was too many days. 
You think I'm making this up? Here's the letter sent from uh, to Denrec from Bloom Energy, and it says, the 12 month rolling actual issue at Red Lion is entirely attributable to the extra day in 2020. But just to make it look good, here's what we're gonna do. We're going to make arrangements to ramp down at Red Lion facility over the course of the remaining days in January so that when you see the report, you won't see an exceedance of a 12 month rolling limited limit reflected in our January report. We're gonna cook the book so it looks good. And we're telling you we're going to cook the books. Why would you have to do that if you weren't over limit? Because nobody cares. Except Lindsay, who keeps track of all this. <laughs> so he has provided for year ending uh, from December of 2020 to June 2021. We've gotten away from the leap day problem. And they're still over. And the reason it's dropped down inside 3,200 to about 28 is because they ramped down uh, Red Lion for a couple days. So the Republican senators, Lindsey, John Nichols, all go back to Sean Garvin and say, now what are you going to do about it? You said you con you concerned about CO2, you're concerned about a yearly rate, so what do we do about all this? And the answer, of course, is uh, he chose not to find Bloom Energy. Neither the Delaware House nor the Delaware Senate did it move to investigate because they're all controlled by Democrats. However, Sean Garvin did find Bloom Energy. The question is for what, not CO2. But he fined them for violating air quality regulations. Wait a minute, I thought they were clean and green and not producing hazardous waste. Well, if you read the fine print, it says what happened instead, according to Denrec, is that Bloom Energy put the new fuel cells to use in June prior to the inspection. In other words, they started them up five weeks early and made money off of it. So he fined them $40,000 for doing that. How much money did they make in the five weeks that they started them up early? Far more than $40,000. Again, park illegally outside, it's only $2 for the fine. If you park legally, you have to pay 20. Let's see. Los Angeles Times, back in April. Corporate secrecy over climate change, targeted by Washington and California. It brought, mentions Bloom Energy, surprisingly. A chancery judge in Delaware, we have a chancery court, which is why a lot of people lo locate in Delaware, which handles corporate uh, law. A chancery judge in Delaware ordered Bloom to open some of the company's books to investors suspicious that the firm exaggerates how green its fuel cell technology is. Hmm. But the court was persuaded by the plaintiff's argument that if the allegations are true, Bloom could be at risk of losing green tech subsidies crucial to the firm's financial health. So the question is, how is our stock doing? And the answer is, you can see there back in 2018, a couple weeks after they started, you can see they dramatically dropped. And that was about the time I gave the presentation in DDP. Again, you and I both know it had, um, that had nothing to do with it. Um, but I'll take all the credit if you'd like. Um, there was a resurgence in early 2021. That's due to the Biden administration's interest in alternative energy, additional investment by venture capitalists, and tax credit incentives, but some other issues have caused it to sort of mellow out. Well, a year later, another group called Hindenburg Research uh, came up with this. I've taken the liberty to put the Hindenburg up because Bloom Energy is now say they're moving out into doing hydrogen production. Um, but the article, published a, a year after our presentation at DDP, concludes, we believe Bloom Energy, once touted as the prospective holy grail of clean energy, I don't know how it ever got that title, but is instead likely to wind up in the history books alongside failed companies like Theranos and Solyndra. It says, contrary to myths about Bloom, our research indicates that Bloom's technology is not sustainable, clean, green, or even remotely profitable. This is exactly what we had concluded. It says, the company's clean narrative is absurd. The research shows that Bloom Energy servers emit significantly more CO2 than the electric grid in key states where it operates. And their conclusion is, Bloom Energy is an obvious bankruptcy candidate. Indeed, in NASDAQ, just two weeks ago, you would read, Bloom Energy may report negative earnings in the second quarter of 2021. Of course they are. They're not a profitable company. 
So you'd assume Bloom Energy is just about ready to collapse. And, well, to steal a line from Mark Twain, reports of Bloom's demise have been greatly exaggerated. Why? Well, here's a report just last week. Hedge funds are crazy about Bloom Energy. They're all over the place. Invest, venture capitalists are investing in it. People seem to think it is the future of clean, green energy when it's anything but that. And it's that myth that somehow keeps everything going. That myth also with the subsidies they're getting from Delaware, which keeps them inflated. So where are Omara and Markel now, the two boys that put all this together oh, nine years ago? Well, actually, Omara didn't hang around very long. He left Delaware in 2014 and became the president and CEO of the National Wildlife Association, or Wildlife Federation, I should say. Markel remained as, as governor until 2017, and just in, April, in uh, June, excuse me, he was appointed the U.S. Ambassador to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development for the Biden administration. The OECD was created to help administer the Marshall Plan, uh, maybe now Jack can use this to create, institute the Beijing Consensus. And I guess maybe he uh, is right after all. Maybe we all should be learning Chinese. So my takeaway messages for all this, instead of being efficient, green, and affordable, bloom energy cells emit more pollution and electricity they generate costs more than five times as much as a state-of-the-art natural gas plant. Moreover, they're being used as part of the Delaware Renewable Energy Portfolio Standards Act, or REPSA, but they're producing more carbon dioxide than regular natural gas combustion. And instead of being clean and free of hazardous waste, Bloom Energy has lied about the hazardous waste produced by their fuel cells, and they continue to lie, aided by the state of Delaware, as to about how, where and how the hazardous waste is treated and to where it's being shipped. So I finished this presentation Thursday evening. I got ready to package it up and leave, and I came across one last article. I just have to show you. Came out on Thursday. Bloom Energy to accelerate development of the market for certified low methane natural gas. Challenges the largest natural gas consumers and energy industry leaders to make similar commitments. It makes me think of the idea of carbon-free sugar. Now we've got low methane natural gas. Maybe someday we'll have natural gas without methane. I don't know. You know. As a postscript, Lindsay has already decided that he's going to sue Sean Garvin, Dean Holden, and David Fees for failure to prevent Bloom Energy from significantly emitting additional amounts of carbon dioxide that cause global warming and pose an existential threat to Lindsay Levine, all of humanity, and all other life forms on planet Earth. I told you he's an environmentalist. He's also going to sue them for failure to follow the laws of thermodynamics, failure to follow the science, and failure to enforce environmental justice. This week, he did inform me that he's also filed a lawsuit against the U.S. EPA. You see, it's his contention that he is the whistleblower that got the EPA to investigate Bloom Energy, and he's therefore entitled to whistleblower um, funds. The Biden EPA says, no, we're not going to give you anything, so he's, followed, uh, he's filed a lawsuit, and we'll see how, how that plays out. I so much wanted to say this all ends in unicorns and, um, and rainbows and that the wheels of justice did work, um, but we're dealing with bureaucrats and that's one of the things I learned from my four months of hell in the federal government, that the people that are there uh, and are always there are the people that are the worst. It's not really the, the people that you elect, it's the people that you don't elect that are the biggest problems. And the same holds true in Delaware. I don't think this is likely to ever change until at some point this all comes to an end. The uh, 2023, I think, comes around or something. The, the, well, I guess it's 2033 when the 21-year deal goes away. And then we can finally get out from under it. Um, we've talked to lawyers of the Republicans. They're afraid to do anything because they say, if you try to renege on this deal, we're going to lose our um, credit rating, and that would destroy the state. I don't know how suing somebody for not keeping up their end of the bargain destroys your credit rating. But then again, I'm not a lawyer. What would I know? So no, I can't leave you with this slide, the slide that I really should leave you with is this one. 
So with that, hopefully I have uh, been able to follow Willie um, in any event. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, if you need questions, yeah, there's a mic over here. Hey, David, you mentioned H2S, hydrogen sulfide, benzene, and a few other pollutants. What about the fuel cells themselves? What, oh. is, what takes place within the fuel cell? How long do they last? What, are they recycled at the end? Do they go to landfills? And what is embedded in the various parts of the, of the fuel cell that might itself be hazardous by the time they've run all these various components of gas and so forth it, through one end and out the other? That's a more technical question for Lindsay, but uh, yes, they do degrade. That's why after four years, they essentially wanted them replaced with the new Mark V versions. Uh, so they do have to be replaced over time. I imagine there are certain parts that can be recycled and certain parts that aren't. I imagine certain things get contaminated and therefore have to be disposed of separately as hazardous waste. So it's not just simply the canisters are the only place the hazardous waste goes. The, the sulfur compounds get on the, fu uh, the um, catalysts and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, really, we're not sure what they're doing with it. My suspicion was for a long time they were warehousing it in that facility on the university campus. Uh, John Nichols asked the university for information, and all of a sudden there's all these manifests going out. We think what happened is the university went over and said, what are you doing with the hazardous waste? And they said, putting them over here in the corner. And they said, got to get them out of here before we get in trouble. So I assume that's what's going to happen, but yeah, that's a, that's a fundamental problem is that they do go bad over time, have to be replaced, and you see they degrade very rapidly too. So their efficiency drops. You mentioned that they, um, the, the, a lot of this hazardous stuff, the benzene and so on, is coming in in the natural gas. When that goes through a regular plant, I assume that gets burned. Um, What's, what's the difference here? I assume it is. Um, I, like I say, I'm not sure how uh, a natural gas plant operates, um, so what, how they would have in terms of the ability to trap, um, I think maybe Joe Limecooler, if he's here, can explain those kinds of things. Lindsay certainly could. Um, but the issue then is that, that we were sold this in the state of Delaware as we do not produce any hazardous waste. That was clearly um, a misstatement of fact, I'll not call it a lie, but it was a misstatement of fact from the get-go. And so, yeah, it, it, I imagine by the combustion process, the uh, byproducts are more easily contained. Whereas many of these boom boxes are going off uh, in, the, in the, well, they've got one of them put in a residential neighborhood in Delaware. And back in 2010, Shridhar and Bloom Energy was featured in 60 Minutes. And he said, by 2020, we plan to have a boom box in every house. So what they would have done with the hazardous waste coming in your house, I, has, I shudder to think. Yes. Hi, you mentioned that um, in your slide, you know, what does this have to do with the rest of us? I noticed on one of your slides, it said Bay Area or uh, Bay Bridge strategies. So I assume that had to do with the San Francisco Bay Area. And I started thinking about uh, the Klamath River dam situation where I'm from, the largest dam destruction, hydro, clean, green, renewable energy, largest dam destruction project in worldwide history. You know, lies, junk science, uh, racketeering, all this stuff that, of course, is not being heard by the public. So I looked up uh, the Bay Bridge strategies and noticed that they changed their name or they became a partner of Tiber Creek which has something to do with the river in Washington, D.C. that ran from somewhere to Capitol Hill. But the fact that they changed their name, looked up on Tiber Creek, and on the bottom of, of that website is Bloomberg Government 2020. So uh, Michael Bloomberg, right? Here's my question. Have you researched, and I look at the board members, and I see uh, people I notice from my days at, at working at Google. Uh, John Doerr, of course, um, uh, John Chambers, and then I notice uh, General Colin Powell. Yeah, I've, got, I've actually got that slide. I pulled it for time constraints. I think I can get that up for you. 
if have you ha has someone connected the dots to the big players in a globalist scheme? Uh, no, that's the one of the next things we need to do. Let's see if I can pull this up. Yeah, there's there's this. And then by May 12th, John, I didn't cover this, but yeah, John Doerr disappeared. Um, but they've had a number of people on the board. Um, yep, there are a lot of issues associated with this, these people. Um, there have been issues with Colin Powell in particular. He was given a lot of stock. Um, at the time he was given it, the stock was worth $30, and he claimed it was worth $1.50. Uh, so his income was a whole lot less. Um, and they decided not to investigate that either. So there's lots of question as to who these people are, what their hidden agendas are, and uh, that is also something we really need to work on. And in fact, very recently, what did I find this Springfield Sun Times that indicated the Beijing consensus? And so we're finding out that um, a lot of things associated with Jack Markell are also um, shady. I've known he's been shady for years. I probably shouldn't say that legally. But in any event, I've known he's been shady for years, and um, now we're just finding out even more so. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.